All right, so we're going to talk about uh, exception handling in LLVM. Uh, and we were essentially, David and I uh, work for Google, and we were responsible for making LLVM's exception handling stuff work well on Windows. We wanted to be compatible with MSVC. And so that's how we got into this mess. Um, so what we're going to talk about, uh, you know, where, where did, what is exception handling? Where did it come from? Uh, you know, how does it work in GCC and LLVM, not on Windows? Uh, and then, you know, what is the MSVC model? How is it different? What do we have to do to make LLVM tolerate it? <laughs> um, so you, know, you should be familiar with exception handling, but it's uh, basically a mechanism for providing uh, non-local control flow transfers you know, out of your current frame back up to some suspended stack frame. And you know, obviously, it returns some alternative data that's not encoded in the return type. It's like some other exception object that's passing back up. And you know, back when C++ was being designed, uh, this was you know, considered important because you know, li library layering was accumulating. And you know, people felt that it was getting increasingly difficult to communicate errors through all those uh, layers. Um, you know, this, the debate on you know, how you do this kind of stuff has uh, gone back and forth, different languages doing different things, but that was the design chosen for C++. Um, anyway, and so it was uh, designed by Bjarne and all the other people, co-conspirators working on C++, sort of from, from the 84 to 89 time frame. Um, and at the end of uh, that process, uh, he, Bjarne published a paper with Andrew Koenig uh, called Exception Handling for C++, and it described a bunch of uh, possible implementation strategies. Um, so the first one, that, you know, like C++ was built on Cfront uh, first, and so that was a translator and a compiler, so they outlined a portable exception handling strategy. Um, and this strategy was basically built, you know, it was all built around desugaring down to C. Um, so it was basic, it was built on, you have explicit linked lists, you know, for your, your local thread you talk about, you know, you have a record on the list, and it talks about what kinds of actions you want to take uh, in this frame should you unwind through it. Um, and then, you know, eventually, uh, if you want to recover from the exception, you, if you want to recover from it in a given frame, you call set jump, you create a little register context, and then if an exception is thrown, you long jump to it. Um, and the nice thing about this is, obviously, you have the desugaring from C++ to C, um, but, and, and it also, uh, it's portable. You don't have to know anything about the platform you're operating on. You don't have to know uh, what the calling conventions are, what the unwind uh, format is, any of that kind of stuff. And you can just, if there's some other compiler out there generating like Fortran code for your platform, like you don't have to care about that stack frame. Uh, as long as it doesn't need to interact with your exceptions, you can go right through it. Um, and at the same time, you know, they also felt it was important to uh, explain that you know we weren't going to be paying uh, all the overhead of this implementation strategy forever and ever in C++. So they outlined the efficient uh, exception handling mechanism. Um, and I don't know if it was built at the time, but it was, you know, there was prior art for this uh, in other in other languages. But you know, it's we should be familiar with this. It's basically built on PC lookup tables. You have you know you do you use a reliable stack unwinding mechanism to figure out what the return address is for a given frame. You take that return address, you do a lookup into a table, it tells you what uh, information or what actions you want to take um, and how to restore the register context so that you can run some code. Um, anyway, different people made different choices. <laughs> uh, and so we're going to talk about some of those people. Uh, so uh, the first implementation that's relevant to our story is the Borland implementation of C++. Um, and they grew support for C++ exception handling and uh, what they called structured exception handling in 1993. Um, and they pretty much went down the, the road of uh, the portable exception handling implementation strategy. Uh, so far as we know, this was all built around uh, you know, linked lists and set jump. Um, we, don't, we don't know how things worked exactly in 93, but we're assuming that they're genetically related to what we were looking at today. Um, and it makes sense why they did this for all the reasons I described before. Uh, the, you know, the Windows toolchain's uh, ecosystem at that time was pretty diverse. You had all these companies, uh, Borland was one of them, and Digital Mars, and I'm, I, I don't know if they were around at the time, but I'm forgetting who the other one, Wacom, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, lots of compilers, lots of different choices. You wanna, you wanna be able to interoperate. Um, the other thing I did was SEH uh, allowed recovering from you know, traps, things that are not C++ exceptions. You know, it was kind of exception handling for C in some ways. Um, and this 
perhaps needlessly complicated their design. Uh, but I'll talk about more about that later. Um, the other thing it let, let you do was kind of like a signal handler, it allowed you to take an exception and then say, actually, you know, I know how to recover from this. Like, I want this division by zero to produce some value. Or I want, um, you know, I'm going to map in the page that you just did a page fault for, or something like that. Um, it's, all, it's all wild and crazy and really outside of the, you know, core language model for C++. Uh, anyway, and so the history is that Microsoft basically adopted this uh, implementation strategy uh, for Windows, and in Win32, it's sort of, I, I don't know the you know, exact history here, but ultimately, you know, this linked list that we're talking about became, you know, got this dedicated thread local slot in FS0, and that's kind of what we have for 32-bit Windows today. Um, the other relevant implementer to our story um, is, is HP. Um, you know, they, they had basically been working on Seafront and uh, other compilers, AC++, um, and they spent many years getting exception handling working, and so after much experience, sometime in the late 90s, you know, they, they took what they had, which was uh, what I'm calling the landing pad model, um, and essentially popularized it through the Itanium C++ ABI, which was essentially a standard C++ ABI uh, intended for the Itanium ISA, which never really, you know, we know that Itanium, the instruction set, never really took off, but uh, what we did get was this, this cool C++ ABI that is very nice. Um, and the, the novel thing about the Itanium, or the landing pad model, is that it used successive unwinding. Um, rather than talking about, uh, if you have destructor actions to run, cleanups to run, rather than talking about uh, which objects need to be destroyed at which stack locations, uh, you would just, always successively unwind the stack to every frame that had an interesting action to take, um, regardless of whether or not it was going to actually catch the exception. Um, and this was actually a good idea because it, compilers don't want to reason about data, like they want to reason about code, they're doing code transformations. And so the, what HP talked about in their uh, documents about this model was, um, they talked about compensation code. So you could do things like, uh, transform a loop from countdown or you know, count up to countdown, and then if you needed to reference that thing in the landing pad, you could have some extra code that would translate it. And you know, this, this would look more or less like normal control flow. Um, so this is was, this was a pretty good idea. Um, anyway, and so it, it has uh, uh, the simple tables. Uh, one of the other interesting things about this model is that um, when HP rolled it out for AC++, they had some documentation that talked about how they switched from talking about try ranges you know, they didn't have like a label for here's the beginning of our try range and here's the end and here's all the stuff in between and oh god never move anything any code uh, inside the try range outside the try range they talked to, they switched to talking about uh, call sites so uh, they have this this call site table and it basically you know tells you what you want to do for the thing and then there's obviously and, and the call site table gives you it only gives you one uh, one label there's really only one place for any given call site uh, that you can go to should an exception be thrown. Um, and then there's the action table, there's an index in the action table, and then uh, the runtime feeds you that index. Or, well, anyway. Um, and you, you decide what you want to do in normal control flow. Anyway, uh, this was popularized uh, through the Itanium C++ ABI, and GCC adopted it, and LLVM came along later and followed suit, because we wanted to be compatible. Um, hang on. Uh, damn. <laughs> uh, anyway, so this is what landing pads look like in LLVM. Uh, we have the invoke instruction, uh, which is, it's a lot like a call, except it has two successors. It has the normal edge successor and the unwind label. Uh, the unwind label must uh, go to a basic block that begins with a landing pad instruction. Uh, the landing pad instruction must be the first non-fee value of that block. Um, and it kind of, the, the value that it produces represents the, essentially the error value, although it's it has more to do with the values that the runtime gives you. It's not really the exception object so much as some stuff you can use to go get it. Um, and then what you do in the landing pad is you use normal control flow uh, based on the selector value, which is provided in EDX on x86, uh, to figure out what you really wanted to do. Uh, and so here's, here's what that dispatch code looks like. It's, it's kind of uh, hairy. Um, you see we take the, the landing pad value and percent, uh, percent zero, uh, we dig out the, the selector values and exception pointers with extract value instructions. 
uh, we compare them against these uh, funny LLVM EH type ID four values. Uh, these are just essentially uh, table indices. Um, and then we, we, we do the comparison, we do a normal conditional branch, uh, and that takes us to these blocks called like catch A or catch B. That's where we actually wanted to, you know, call puts A or puts B. Um, so all, the, all this code is just dispatch code, but it's, it's normal code, which is, you know, it might be a good thing, but, or it might be a bad thing, it might be bloated, but, uh, you know, compilers like to reason about code, so it's a good thing, <laughs> for us at least. Um, and then uh, if, if the exception was not meant to be handled here, uh, what actually happens is you fall through, uh, in the last, uh, the last catch fall through on the right-hand side, you actually fall through to the EH resume label, uh, which uses the LVMIR resume instruction, which indicates, essentially, this is what would happen if um, we were going to call uh, destructor cleanups and continue unwinding. And you can think of it as um, an alternative return. Uh, you know, in LLVM, if you execute the return instruction, you come out the normal edge of the invoke. Uh, if you execute resume, you come out the unwind label of uh, your invoke. Um, one of the other advantages of this model for LLVM is that we still have single, ex uh, single, en single entry, single exit basic blocks. Uh, and that's pretty important when you're doing, you know, data flow analyses and like trying to form SSA, uh, these kinds of things. Um, I, you know, I haven't worked on implementing any of these algorithms in LLVM, but I hear it's important to have, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty core assumption of how things work. Um, changing to a, you know, single entry multi-exit uh, model would be a very large disruption to LLVM, something we really don't want to do. Um, anyway, the other advantage of this model is I think I've been saying this all along, is that it, it keeps the control flow for that dispatch. It's all, it's all normal control flow. There aren't like multiple successors, multiple possible successors of an invoke. Um, you can actually, like you can split edges from, from an invoke to a landing pad to insert some code should you want to. Like that, that all works. Um, and we actually, and we know how to inline in this model. We know, like I said, you can basically chain the, just like you would chain the return instruction of an inline call to the you know, successor of a regular call, you take the, the resume and you, with some modification, you chain it onto the, the uh, landing pad unwind destination of the invoke. Um, yeah, unfortunately, like this is not how Windows exception handling works. <laughs> um, it does not use successive unwinding, so I'll talk about that. Um, so what happens for, for Windows exceptions is you have, uh, you essentially have tables that are mapping from a program state number you sort of have this linear state of your program um, at the source level. And there are you know, some tables, which I'll describe later, uh, which are basically mapping to uh, funklets, which are little functions um, that are, the runtime is going to call back to implement various actions. Um, and the funklets are interesting. They basically, you know, they're, they're a separate function that you can call, and they have a separate prologue and a separate epilogue, um, and they'll, they'll return control back to the runtime, but they essentially share their uh, frame layout with uh, the, the parent function. And they do this essentially by not using ESP to address the stack pointer and uh, arranging to pass the EBP or RBP, you know, frame pointer value into, you know, the funklet. So the runtime goes and gets it as, a, you know, from unwinding the stack takes it, passes it in as sort of a hidden parameter or something like that, um, and then you just assign it to that register and you go on pretending that, you know, we're in the same function, we have the same stack frame layout, you know, everything can talk about the same local variables, all that kind of stuff. Um, this, is, this is very strange for LLVM. Um, so this, <laughs> this is kind of the major challenge we have to solve. Um, and these funklets implement uh, three main actions that we cared about. Um, the first is SEH filters, which are kind of a very special case for SEH. Um, they are basically expressing what you would normally express with C++ type information uh, through data, uh, through code instead. Um, and the awkward thing is that they can actually have side effects, um, and this hurts us a lot, but anyway. Uh, the other thing is uh, cleanups and catches. And those are pretty simple. We understand how they're supposed to work for C++. Like, we understand the 
you know, a control flow model of how destructors work. The runtime will always call us in a certain way, so we can, we can actually keep these as part of the, the main CFG and use them to optimize. Um, and so the way, that the, the way that Windows actually interacts with the runtime is a little bit different from the successive unwinding model of, uh, of landing pads. Um, what happens is, you know, first the exception is raised, like the OS gets it. You call raise exception, you call throw, whatever. Um, and then you do a, you sort of do the search phase. You walk the stack, uh, look, calling all the personality functions. I guess one thing I've glossed over is that every, if you have interesting exceptional actions that you want to take on your, for your function, uh, if an exception goes through it, you have a personality function. And this basically is, on Windows, this is practically speaking essentially C++, SEH, or something else like uh, .NET. Uh, and the runtime will call you back to say, do you want this exception, you know, yes or no. And the personality function will go and look at the tables that it knows how to interpret, and then you know, interact with your program to figure out, do you want to catch this exception? Um, so for C++, this means um, looking at uh, tables and doing type ID comparisons. Uh, but for SEH, this means running the SEH filter function. So th this is interesting because we're actually getting user code run during the search phase of exception handling, which is very strange. Um, after we've figured out which frame we want to handle the exception, the runtime goes back and calls each personality function again. And unlike the successive unwinding model, all of this cleanup actions uh, happens um, you know, deeper on the stack. Um, and you know, sometimes bad things can happen here. Uh, sometimes you can throw an exception while you're uh, running a destructor and the personality figures out what's supposed to happen, but it's implementation defined. Something happens. Uh, anyway, and then finally we get to the frame that wanted to catch the exception. We call the personality function and in the case of C++, uh, what actually happens is we're still in Funklet land. We still haven't caught the exception. Uh, we are still deep on the stack. Uh, we have not unwound yet. Uh, and yeah, anyway, and so when the, when the catch Funklet returns, uh, that is when the actual you know, final one and only register context reset occurs and we've caught the exception. We've hit the closing brace of the uh, catch block and we're back in the parent function and life is good again. Um, so, you know, to contrast it with the landing pad model, great, there's only one register context reset. Um, we, are, we are way deep on the stack. Um, it's very different. And in C++, the, uh, the exception object actually lives uh, in the frame of the function calling throw. Uh, this is in contrast to the Itanium model where the exception object it lives essentially on the heap and is pointed to via thread local storage. Um, and you know, what, what this means is you can't, actually, you can't actually implement MSVC compatible exception handling with a successive unwinding strategy. Um, MinGW does this, right? You, it, it uses a strategy where you, uh, it uses the OS to you know, raise exceptions and uses the, the regular unwinder, um, but once it gets an exception it decides it likes, it just takes over um, and just by itself goes and successively resets to, to landing pads. And if we try to do that with MSVC exceptions, we would end up with a stack use after return situation, basically. Um, anyway, so this was sort of the core reason for like why we discarded the option of just, well, why don't we implement our own personality that you know, lives with our compiler and we know how to work with? Um, basically because we'd have to do all of, we'd have to do most of the work that we did in LLVM anyway uh, to essentially have all these split frame uh, modeling. Um, anyway, so I'm going to hand it over to David and he's going to talk about some of the things we tried. <laughs> uh, so one of the uh, sort of obvious ways of trying to implement this sort of thing would be to outline these exceptional actions in the front end. And uh, this has a couple of pros behind it. You know, you, you get to separate the, this weird quirky behavior that's really specific to one platform away from LLVM. So LLVM never has to worry about it. Um, and, uh, you know, separation of concerns is a good thing generally, but uh, on the other hand, we saw a huge problem with this approach. Uh, it turns into a massive optimization barrier. 
And um, this is because if you want to do anything in LLVM, uh, you know, you run a scalar optimization pass to first get rid of, you know, your local variables, promote them into registers. Uh, you can't do that interprocedurally, like not, not without, you know, doing a lot of work in LLVM. Almost, you know, all of the really, really important passes, uh, you know, they're, they're not interprocedural. GVN's not, SROA isn't, it's combined. You know, you'd basically be turning the optimizer off. Um, and that's kind of unfortunate in a uh, programming language like C++ where uh, exceptional cleanups are actually quite common. Um, so we, 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 we discarded that as a, uh, as a practical solution for, uh, for C++. But we, we thought like, you know, well, well, you know, what would happen if we, if we you know, followed through and actually did it? Well, it turns out that uh, modeling them as just normal functions isn't quite right either because the uh, prologues and epilogues wouldn't be right. Uh, they don't have a normal frame pointer, right? They, don't, they, they get a frame pointer from the, the quote unquote parent function. Uh, so we'd have to teach the back end to sort of reason about uh, the, the mechanics of one LLVM IR function sort of using some other uh, functions uh, frame. And this is a pretty big affront to how uh, cogeneration works in LLVM. You know, Two functions don't really interact. In fact, we blow away a function. You know, once we're done cogenerating it, it's over. It's gone. Um, so that that would be kind of unfortunate. And uh, you know, th th there, there's like you know, just too much surgery to make this to make this happen. And uh, the, the trade-offs weren't right. Um, for the record, it, it does work for uh, for things like SCH filters, and that's how we decided to model uh, SCH filters. It turned out not to be a lot of surgery for them. And it, it provided us the right trade-offs because we don't want to model all of the obscene horror of an SCH filter. We'd rather just say, like, you know, the SCH filter is unmodeled. Uh, try not to end the world inside of one of them. Um, uh, so then uh, we moved on to our next implementation strategy, which was, uh, you know, we'll use landing pads in the IR and then outline them somewhere around uh, code gen prepare. Um, so to do this, uh, well, we have landing pads, but as Reed mentioned, we don't really have landing pads. Uh, we have to somehow transform landing pads into these funklets. Uh, and to do that, we would uh, insert these sort of intrinsic markers inside of the IR and then sort of pattern match our way through it to figure out, all right, here's where you know, this catch handler is and here's where this catch handler is. And you know, all right, so some control flow is shared between them. We got to like duplicate the code out and you know, do, do all sorts of funny surgery. and like. Oh, we see a variable is like live into the catch handler. All right, so we got to demote that onto the stack and turn that into loads and stores. Um, and you know, we 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 implemented you know I, I don't know how much code a lot to do this sort of thing in CodeGen Prepare. Um, yeah, so uh, let's just move through a, a very small example. Uh, this is um, sort of patterned after the earlier one, uh, and you know, it's landing pad. Hey. And uh, here's the code that we have to pattern match away. It looks pretty obvious, pretty easy to, to pattern match. It wasn't hard to pattern match. It's great. You know, we can see wh where catch A and catch B are. We can figure out the type comparisons. We can f see the, uh, the uh, resumption point where if none of them match, we have to unwind, which, al which also we don't, you know, that isn't a thing you put into, into you know, code. It's uh, like an implicit thing that's represented in the tables that we have to generate. Um, so we have to, we have to pattern match that out. Um, and uh, here, here's a little bit more of a complicated example. Um, notice uh, that now instead of just branching to catch A and then branching to catch B, we're branching to catch A or B, and that's because simplify CFG and inscombine figured out that like, oh hey, catch A and catch B are the same. So <laughs> we can just like fuse together the type ID comparisons and do a branch off of an OR. So like now things are getting a little bit, a little bit tricky. Like, we have to like walk through ores, and like maybe we'll have to walk through trees of ores, and you know, it, it it doesn't work, right? You can't turn applesauce back into apples. It's just not a viable thing to do. Don't try to do it. It's bad. You know, it's a it's a it's a big problem. So you know, uh, you know, as as we were uh, working through this, uh, we realized that there were further limitations. Like that, you know, got us far enough that we could start to see where the the wheels were falling off, and I think we'll yeah. talk more about that. Yeah, uh, you can hold on to that. I've got this. All right. um, 
Yeah, so we actually got pretty far with the uh, landing pad pattern matching approach at O0, but uh, it also, you know, we, we learned a lot of things about the tables that we didn't know before we got into this process. Um, the C++ exception handling tables actually have these uh, strange lexical scope, strange, strange to us lexical scoping requirements uh, that look a lot more like the source structure of the program. And LLVM doesn't have this, like we don't have scopes. You know, maybe we should, but that would be a very large change uh, to LLVM. And we didn't wanna, uh, we didn't wanna go there. Um, so we had to do something else. Um, I guess basically going into this, what we thought we could do is essentially um, for every, we could pretend like every invoke had its own try around it with its own set of actions and it would just, they would be very big tables, very denormalized. Um, and you know, we just, we didn't need that, like, we didn't need to preserve that uh, nesting. We didn't think it was important to the runtime and we found out we were wrong. Um, so what, what, the, what the try block map, the try block map is essentially a description of uh, try ranges and it thinks it's, it's phrased in terms of this program state number. Um, and it's kind of, it's an array of, it has these, these triples of states. Uh, and these, these triples form, uh, you know, two intervals that are, that need to be joined. And if you ever write a C++ source, you know, C++ program at the source level, this is always true. You always have try followed by catch. Like you can't separate them. Um, and so these, these intervals have to be non-overlapping. And it kind of forces our compiler's output to lot, look a lot more like C++ in a way that you know, LLVM isn't used to having to do that, right? It, like it comes out, it looks like assembly. It looks like basic block soup. Um, anyway, um, so, so this is kind of what, what I mean by uh, you know, non-overlapping intervals. You have like the C++ source program on the left. You have your little program straight num state number line, um, which you can kind of, you know, you can assign that state kind of however you see fit. Um, the ordering of like intervals that are not overlapping is not important, um, but uh, they can't overlap. <laughs> they have to be either fully contained or non-overlapping, uh, as in this example. Um, so, yeah. so, now that we learned uh, the wonders of state numbering, uh, we, we saw fit to fix, um, to fix our implementation approach to one that would ac accurately and correctly represent this in the IR, because we wanted uh, to, you know, through optimization passes, still produce things that would be correctly scoped. Um, and uh, the way we did this is we created these, uh, th this like family of new instructions. Catch pad, cleanup pad, I think you can kind of guess what they'll do. Uh, and catch ret and cleanup ret, which uh, pair with them. And, and using this, uh, you know, you walk from a catch pad to the, the catch rets and from the cleanup pad to the cleanup rets, you can, you know, pretty easily find the funklets. It's uh, not nearly as dramatic. And because of this nesting requirement, we also have to find all of the edges coming out of a funklet. And the way we do that is with these new instructions, catch end pad and cleanup end pad. And we'll get to a more concrete example in a little bit. And to, to, to make this really work for real, we had to introduce a new type called token. Um, so the, the cool thing about token types is that they can't be obscured. You can't store them or load them through memory. Um, you, know, you can't select them, you can't feed them. Uh, and because of this, you can easily walk from the, the def, which would be a catch pad or a cleanup pad, to the use, which would be the uh, cleaned up red or catch red. And you know, this makes it absolutely trivial and in fact feasible uh, to uh, go and, and form funklets from uh, LVMIR. Um, and yeah, we use catch end pad and clean up end pad as uh, you know, unwind uh, edges inside of the invokes for a, a catch pad and a clean up pad so that we can find all of the invokes inside of a catch pad or clean up pad. Um, so uh, here's a pretty simple example. It's, you know, it's a function that's gonna going to throw and has two handlers for two different types, A and B. Um, so for the throw part, it's unchanged. You know, invoke with a normal successor, try.cont, and an exceptional successor, uh, dispatch.a. Um, for the catch handler, it's a little bit different now. Now we have a catch pad, and uh, this catch pad has two successors, a, a sort of I'm handling it successor, and uh, it's not for me successor. And uh, the uh, catch pad produces this token, CPA, which gets consumed by the catch ret, um, and the uh, invoke inside of handle.a uh, has an unwind label pointing to the catch end pad. And, uh, uh, you know, what if, what if uh, catch a isn't uh, appropriate for this exception? Well, we have this other catch pad, catch b, catch pad for uh, type b, and uh, catch pad for type b has a, uh, you know, 
a, a sort of I'm handling it successor, which is handle that B, and an unwind label catch end, which uh, says like this is not going to be handled by this catch pad. Um, and of course, the invoke uh, for ca for handle uh, B uh, also will unwind to that catch end um, instruction. Uh, so, sort of to, to to put all of the exceptional edges on on one slide, you can sort of see that um, the the, uh, the you know a catch pad will either unwind to another catch pad or catch end pad, and the invokes will un, uh, unwind to the uh, catch end pad that's uh, sort of uh, scoping them together, and this allows us to you know from a catch end pad walk uh, backwards and find um, all of the invokes and catch pads that sort of make up the funklets, uh, and this made uh, you know creating funklets from LLVM like super reasonable. Um, and yeah, it, it, it works great. We can run the optimizations. Uh, all sorts of like, strange things are happening now, like Rust is using this. Um, it's really interesting to see how easy it is for other people to just sort of pick it up and, and use it for stuff. Um, and yeah, like, there are some quirks. You know, it, it didn't, you know, there, there's, there's a little bit of stuff that we have to do. Like if unreachable happens, then uh, we, we might have to do some cloning because tail merging can occur. Um, that's considered you know, that's not dramatic to fix. It's uh, a little bit of code, you know, around 1,200 lines to do uh, all of the coloring, demotion, and cloning necessary to keep uh, funklets uh, sort of together. Um, but, you know, not a big deal. We still do demotion in, in each prepare. Um, we consider this to be like an intermediary step. We would rather uh, have the registrar allocator sort of do this for us, but for now, this seems to work pretty well. Um, and uh, we'll stick to it until we can get the register allocator stuff done. Um, so, uh, in the, you know, we would really like it for uh, us to let us uh, inline into cleanups. We can't do this right now. There's a weird quirk uh, in the uh, sort of EH tables that represent C++ exceptions. They can't represent exceptional actions inside of cleanups. It's kind of a bummer for us. Um, we have to detect this while we're doing inlining. Um, <laughs> which is a little bit awkward. We have some, some strategies on how to fix this, but for now we just disable inlining into cleanups. It's, it's temporary. Yeah, it's uh, also what MSVC and ICC do, uh, yeah. which is kind of a bummer. because Yeah. Uh, yeah but. Um, the funklet parent relationship, because we, uh, you know, we have to maintain that nesting that Reed uh, alluded to earlier. Um, that's implicit. We sort of discovered by walking unwind edges. We might want to consider making that more explicit by having um, catch pads consume like the token of the funklet that they're inside of, if they're nested, it's something that we might want to do. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we were interested in, in moving the, the spill placement into the register allocator and out of uh, the cogen prepare phase. And there, there are some design decisions that we're thinking about revisiting. Um, so the way catchpad works is it's a terminator because it, it has control flow. But it also has to be the first instruction in a basic block, which means that it's the only instruction in a basic block, which is kind of weird and makes it unsplittable. Maybe we want to make it splittable. Maybe we want to turn them into switches. That remains to be seen. Um, come to our BOF. Uh, BOF? BOF, yeah. yeah. Buff, yeah. Buff, yeah. Uh, later, if you want to uh, discuss these sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, one more. Yeah, so I mean, in, I mean, yeah, so basically this works. Uh, we have MSCC compatible exception handling in Clang. Um, and it also does SEH. Uh, one of the things that we did not do, this work did not cover modeling uh, non-call exceptions, uh, which is a frequently requested feature. Um, uh, all, all we, for our purposes, all we needed to be able to do was essentially recover from another part of the program crashing. Um, much more like you know, a signal handler or something like this. Um, so that's, that's future work. Um, and uh, you know, I think we were able to actually, we were able to do this. The important thing is not that we did it. <laughs> the important thing is that we were able to do it without breaking too many of LLVM's core invariants. Uh, you know, SSA, SSA still works. You can still have uh, fee nodes on you know, our, our new instructions. Like, that works fine. And uh, you know, even with the unsplittable blocks, we, had to go, we ran through the optimizer. And we didn't find, you know, there were not that many changes uh, that we needed to make. Um, so and you know. Come to the buff if you want to keep talking about the new representation and see how we can improve it. Uh, otherwise, yeah, questions? <laughs> uh, 
So there was, uh, there was when you were talking about the differences in the, um, in the exception models and there was, uh, and the personality um, functions, there was one thing that le leapt out to me that might be a difference in behavior, which is if an exception is thrown but is never caught, um, does the stack get unwound and the destructors run, or does it just go directly to terminate? Uh, uncaught exceptions will, will they'll, they'll, they'll be a, a, a final handler that'll, that'll I don't, call terminate I, for you. I, yeah, but I think you essentially, I think you don't get your destructors running. I remember looking at this the other day. I That's think. Side of it. Oh, oh, yeah, no, no, your destructors don't get run. Yeah, I think they, I think they don't get run. Um, hmm. Don't depend on that. <laughs> oh, no. But. Don't do that. Bad. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, yeah, wondering if it happens on the platform or not. Uh, they don't. I think they don't. But yeah, I, b I believe on the other, on the, when, if you have the stack unwinding, then as, you know, as you're looking for them and you get, and the stack gets unwound, the destructors get run. So that's, that would be a difference in behavior. Yeah, it's interesting. There is, there is a search phase and then there is a, a cleanup phase. There is not just <laughs> do it as you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's not visible to the user because there's no, uh, there's no um, analog of an SCH filter to allow you to run user code during the search phase. You can write your own personality function if you want to, but... Uh, <laughs> Hi, uh, I haven't used the uh, LLVM uh, exception, um, but I used the uh, exception handling uh, many years ago on PC. So I knew that um, on Microsoft uh, Visual Studio developers, you, um, studios, you can uh, set a catch on exception uh, when it is not a uh, catch. You can set a breakpoint on exception throw to catch a throw. Um, so when it is not uh, caught, you will be able to uh, stop at the throw point. Uh, is it uh, available now with their LVM uh, running on Windows? I, yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't think that using LVM changes the way the, uh, I mean, we throw exceptions the same way that, that MSVC does. We call the same runtime function. Uh, throwing exceptions is easy. Catching exceptions is hard. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, my specification is about the uh, integration with the uh, development tools on Windows. So uh, the LLVM compiled uh, modules will be able to uh, work with the uh, existing tools in the same way as uh, like Microsoft compiled uh, object files that uh, can uh, set a breakpoint at exception throw point. I, 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 I'm not sure I understood the question, but I... I can answer the question. Okay. Okay, sorry. I see. So okay. 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 If you try to debug it in LLDB, um, no, it, it also won't work. <laughs> 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 I think. Yes, yeah, so that's actually not strictly true. You can still break on exception throws. You just may be able to understand what the stack unwinder does as it looks at your code. So. Some parts will work. It's you know, it's as you get support for code view and PDBs, then the whole thing should be pretty seamless. But a lot of the stuff is built into the OS, so it's not even a. Yeah, I'm not sure I understood the question for uh, what, what. What would happen if you debugged Clang in yeah. Visual Studio? Well, yeah, we, we give you line tables. So if you set a breakpoint on the catch handlers, yeah. you would you would see the backtrace. So yeah. it would show you all the catch handlers that you propagated through. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that'll so just work. That's low level stuff. Yeah, that's through OS notification. Likewise, it goes after it searches for the handler, it goes back and asks the debugger, hey, do you care about this? And. <laughs> Did, yeah. Sure. Well, hello. We run off time. Okay. okay. But if you want to talk more about it, we have the, the boff, so we're happy to keep going. <laughs>